and welcome to this episode of the Good Citizen Podcast. Today, I want to dive into the topic, what free speech costs. Now, many of us, and I sure hope all of us, uh, recognize freedom of speech as a key right that is fundamental to the American experiment. It is also very helpful uh, to the Christian gospel. You think of those First Amendment rights of freedom of speech, a free exercise of religion. Are they necessary for the gospel to go forward? No, because the kingdom's going to move forward. The gospel is going to go forward regardless, but they sure are helpful in spreading the gospel, not worrying as you are stepping up to a, a pulpit on Sunday morning. You know, somebody going to come through the back door to arrest me or stepping up into a public space to, to share the good news, even knocking on doors to share the good news of the gospel with folks. Um, these are things that as Americans, I think we've, we've long just assumed would, would be there. Uh, that this was a part of our schooling, that this was something that if you polled Americans would would have wide support. But I think we all re recognize that in 2024, uh, these long recognized uh, cherished rights are under attack, uh, at least under deep scrutiny in many places. And we, we see the college campus. There was one stat uh, that I was looking at recently that's certainly troubling. And the stat goes that back in the 1970s and 1980s, only one out of four students on a college campus wanted to ban, quote unquote, extreme speakers uh, because of a recognition of free speech. Now, they can say what they want to say. I just don't have to attend. But the majority of college students wanted to do so. They wanted to ban, quote unquote, extreme speakers in 2019. Of course, that definition of extreme uh, could be whatever uh, the particular individual thinks is extreme. And so this recognition, this respect for uh, freedom of speech, free exercise of, of religion, isn't something that we can just assume anymore. And so when I say, what does free speech cost? It co will cost us some things. And I want to uh, get into that towards the end of this episode. Now, earlier this week, I filed an amicus brief on behalf of uh, Students for Life of America, Young America's Foundation, and Indiana Family Institute uh, in the Seventh Circuit. Um, in support of a student uh, with the initials ED uh, from Noblesville High School right here in Indiana. And I thought this case uh, was just a, a, a great reflection. I mean, it's a troubling, but a, a, a key reflection of where free speech is and why it needs to be defended. And so I wanted to go through the facts of this case. Uh, I was, was certainly troubled by what happened. And then as I was seeing what was going on with Students for Life of America, Young America's Foundation, I just wanted to be able to bring some of that perspective to you as you think about what, what is free speech going to cost us as engaged citizens? Why should we be thinking about this? What can we do? And so I wanted to bring uh, some of the facts of this, this case to you. Now, because this case is in active litigation, I'm essentially going to just be reading what is already public. So if it sounds like I'm reading just a little bit more than normal, that that is why. But essentially what happened in this case is that Noblesville High School, uh, Noblesville is uh, northeast of Indianapolis, uh, just a bit in a sense a suburb. Um, Noblesville High School derecognized a student club because of the pro-life messages on the group's flyer. Uh, so if you remember an episode from last year, we had on Julia Barley, who's a law school student, and then Professor John Hill. And they recounted this story of how at the law school, uh, there were a number of student organizations there, but the, the pro-life display uh, was not going to be allowed. And so uh, we remember that story, how Julia Barley uh, stood up and said, no, we, we have a right to free speech. These other groups are here. We also have the right to be here. And Professor John Hill also stepped in. Uh, to assist. And so there's uh, there are some echoes of what happened there, but in this case, in a high school. And before I jump into all of the facts of the case, uh, just a, a quick note on why why is it important to be involved in litigation, to be involved in courts? Perhaps this is very obvious uh, to all, uh, but something that I have reflected on because uh, practicing law is the most difficult thing that I have ever done. And of course, if whatever profession, whatever calling God's called you to do, you're like, yeah, why don't you try this? <laughs> All right. Uh, why don't you try this? Um, but it is, it's, it's very intense. Of course, it's time consuming. Uh, you can, I, and I have experienced this, you know, file an appeal all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, do all of that work, and then uh, get denied. Um, you can do all this work, and then a judge decides your case. And so very high stakes, um, very intense. But it's important because the courts, the judicial system is, in a sense, the last responsive branch of government. Now, those of you uh, in the legislative branch and the executive branch um, uh, may, may differ with this opinion, but in a sense, we have Congress, especially at the federal level, and I would specifically speaking here on the federal level, um, Congress 
it, w many people will say, well, Congress, do your job. And there are so many things that uh, we wish Congress would would jump in. I mean, this is the, uh, the elected body of folks from around the United States that we've asked to go to D.C., uh, but because of, of so much dysfunction and infighting, the difficulty of bringing a consensus together, many times concerns just go unaddressed. And, and also in the executive branch, uh, you have uh, the bureaucracies, the departments that can do things, uh, but through executive orders that can be changed um, pretty simply with uh, the next administration coming in. So I think many Americans have turned to the courts. We say we're a litigious society. This may be one reason why. have turned to the courts because due to the federal rules of civil procedure, this is true in your state as well, a federal judge can't just sit on something like they can't just not respond. They uh, if you file a complaint, the, the rules uh, procedures say, all right, this this process starts. There's a, a complaint. There's an answer. Uh, there's motion to dismiss. There's discovery. And that moves on towards some sort of judgment. And so uh, it, it can't just sit there. So I think many Americans with with grievances and concerns have turned to the courts uh, for that reason. And so it's important for uh, us to be involved. Uh, so back to this particular case, we, we know from a 2021 U.S. Supreme Court case, and I, I love the way that the Supreme Court framed this, that, that schools are the nurseries of democracy. Uh, so they're the nurseries of democracy. They're teaching students a whole host of issues, but one of them is how to be a good citizen. How do, how, how do freedoms uh, work? How do rights work in our society? How, how are we going to respect differences in a freedom of speech in an increasingly plural society. So that's one of the jobs of the school, the nurseries of democracy. And unfortunately, in this case, I would say that the defendants in this matter expelled rather than encouraged those constitutional rights on the school campus. So let's dig into the facts a bit of this case. Uh, this is happening right now. Um, and so it's something I wanted to, to just share with you, let you reflect on. So E.D. is a student at Noblesville High School in Indiana. Uh, during the summer before her freshman year, she began seeking an opportunity to start and lead a pro-life club at her school called Noblesville Students for Life. Her goal was to raise awareness and generate discussion about the abortion issue while also doing something about it through volunteering. Her club would have stood alongside several, several other student-led clubs at ED School, including the Conservation Club, Campus Crusade for Christ, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Gender and Sexuality Alliance, Key Club, Leo Club, no Noblesville Young Democrats, Young Republicans, and Police Explorers. ED followed all the requirements to officially start the Noblesville Students for Life as a student interest group, including meeting with her principal ahead of time to discuss, discuss the club. Initially, her principal approved the club. And at the school's fall activities fair, shortly thereafter, more than 30 students signed up uh, for the club. The school's attitude quickly changed. After the fall activities fair, Edie prepared a flyer to advertise a meeting for the club. It included photographs of students holding signs in front of the U.S. Supreme Court reading, I reject abortion, defund Planned Parenthood, and I am the pro-life generation. School officials told her she could not post the flyer. No written policy prohibited the flyer, but administrators insisted that she post it without the picture referencing Planned Parenthood because it was too, quote unquote, political. After ED again met with administrator to try to get her flyer approved, the principal de-recognized the group. Uh, this was an unprecedented move to just not just say, hey, you can't put the flyer up, but actually just completely de-recognize the group. You cannot be an officially recognized group on the Noblesville campus. Uh, so ED, uh, through her attorneys at Charitable Allies, uh, filed a lawsuit. And unfortunately, the, the federal district court in this matter uh, decided uh, for the defendants, for the school, saying the school was within its rights to deny the flyer, de-recognize the group because of the quote-unquote political message. Uh, another a term that was used as not appropriate for the students uh, due to its content. So the, the basic point of the lawsuit is, well, you have all of these other student groups. Students also don't check their First Amendment rights at the schoolhouse gate. There's a famous case called Tinker. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but they have the right to, to have individual expression um, as long as it does not substantially interrupt the, the academic environment at the school. And there was no proof that that, that was going to occur because the flyer uh, was never posted and because this, the group was derecognized. So I was able to step in um, and file what's called an amicus brief on behalf of Students for Life of America, as I mentioned, Young America's Foundation, Indiana Family Institute. And as we're talking through on this podcast, just 
for some that may not be aware of how how this works, just briefly, an amicus brief is essentially a friend of the court brief, and these are filed to assist the court in uh, deciding the matter uh, through some outside information. So information that would not be uh, available through one of the parties necessarily. And so Students for Life of America, Young America's Foundation, Indiana Family Institute, all um, asked the, the court for permission to file a brief uh, due to their interest in the case. And primarily because, as we noted in the brief, the facts of this matter are all too familiar. And so just getting to uh, some of the information, again, publicly available as it's been filed uh, with the court, is that the Students for Life of America, if you're familiar with that group, is the nation's largest pro-life youth organization that uniquely represents the generation most targeted for abortion. SFLA exists to recruit, train, and mobilize the pro-life generation to abolish abortion, provide policy, legal, and community support for women and their children born and pre-born. SFLA has more than 1,400 student chapters. I thought this was interesting. With thousands of members on middle, middle, high school, college, university, medical, and law school campuses in all 50 states and Puerto Rico. And SFLA uh, reported that free speech violations on school campuses tripled over the 2022 through 2023 school year. And this is where, hopefully this is helpful to you as you're thinking about free speech in your area. Um, this included destruction or theft of displays, censorship by school administrators, and even death threats. Uh, by way of example, Felipe Avila and the Students for Life chapter at the East, uh, East Career Technical Academy sued the Clark County School District in Nevada due to disparate treatment of the ECTA, that's the East Career Technical Academy Students for Life chapter. School administrators blocked that Students for Life chapter from posting flyers in the school hallways and writing announcements for the school newspaper while allowing the same expressive activity by other student organizations. The Student for Life flyers, which included the statement, I reject abortion, were considered too controversial by administrators and rejected. Um, ECTA and uh, the, the school district recently settled uh, with Avila and the Students for Life chapter. Something else you know, we, we noted in the in the case is what you're looking for any you know further evidence of the difficulty that Students for Life is experiencing. Um, Edie, in this particular case I mentioned, the Noblesville case, was attempting to start an SFLA student chapter, was met with inconsistent instructions, and then an unprecedented derecognition of the nascent pro-life club due to the a flyer the administration deemed inappropriate and too political. So if you're unfamiliar with Young America's Foundation and kind of the point of the amicus brief, bring, you know, bringing some of this perspective uh, to the court, if you're unfamiliar with uh, YAF, uh, or they use the kind of the, the term YAF uh, chapters, uh, they're a nonprofit organized with a mission to educate and inspire young Americans uh, from middle school through college with the ideas of individual freedom, a strong national defense, free enterprise, and traditional values. Uh, one way that YAF fulfills its mission is through student-led Young Americans for Freedom chapters on campuses across the nation. And students in YAF clubs also face regular violation of their rights uh, to freedom of speech and freedom of association. So, for, for example, um, YAF or YAF, uh, the YAF student group at the University of Buffalo, recently sued the university due to rec uh, revocation of its status as a, revoc as a recognized group and revocation of access to a student fee funding. The university adopted a policy that barred recognition for any group affiliated with a national organization. And according to YAF's complaint, the student body president told the Student Association Senate, we all know why we are doing this. Let me read that again. We all know why we are doing this. Uh, so the group gets derecognized because they're affiliated with a national organization. The University of Buffalo eventually reversed its policy and restored YAF's recognition as a student club. However, the university is now requiring student groups, uh, get this, to sign away their legal rights so you can't sue right, as a condition of recognition. And YAF has challenged this new infringement. Oh, hey, you can, you can have your group, but uh, you have to, in a sense, waive your right to association, your right to sue. Um, if, if you become a recognized group. Uh, so again, YAF has challenged it. Uh, another student at a high school, so Luke Wong is his name, at Harrison High School in New York, challenged his school's administration after an assistant principal denied recognition for a YAF club for the third time. The administrative, 
administration provided three different and arbitrary reasons, reasons for the denial, including this statement. We typically do not create clubs for organizations that students are involved with or could be involved with outside of school. This statement ignored the fact that Harrison High recognized 33 different groups at the time, including Friends of Rachel, the Gay Straight Alliance, Relay for Life, and Youth to Youth. Several of these clubs have, have ties to national organizations and provide activities for students, quote unquote, outside of school. <laughs> so after a two-year legal battle, Harrison High finally relented and recognized the YAF club. So these cases uh, taken together show a clear and troubling pattern. Eager students approach administrators about starting or advertising an SFLA or YAF club, and the administrators respond by denying their request through ambiguity or pretext or by overtly declaring their political message or stance too controversial. And we mentioned that the, the Noblesville Club clearly falls into this mold. And so I, I was not aware of, of some of these happenings and until recently. And so I thought I would, would share those with you as to where, where are we with free speech in this country? And as we said, the schools, our high schools, our universities, we're not, we're not talking about first, second grade. We're talking about high school. We're talking about universities. They're supposed to be those nurseries of democracy. And it certainly raises the question of kind of what is being, being taught. Now, if you're unfamiliar with just the basic legal protections here. There's a case called Tinker, which involved students wearing black armbands to protest the Vietnam War. And the, the school uh, punished those students, required them to take off uh, the armbands, uh, saying that it was disruptive to the, the environment. And they, they took that case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the students uh, procured their right to, to protest, in a sense, um, at the school, to, to have or raise a political viewpoint, their own political views, and uh, the, the U.S. Supreme Court, in a kind of a famous phrase, says that, that students do not check their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. Um, so it, certainly students in their own you know, capacity as an individual have the right to free exp expression. Um, this would differ somewhat, at least this is kind of where the case law has fallen out. If it is a school publication, or in a sense it's the school's speech, of course, have said that the schools can have more control over that because it, it bears kind of their stamp of approval. When it is just a student's speech, though, like in Tinker with the black armband, or in this case, a flyer, this is the individual student's speech. They, they have the right to freedom of speech there. And so that, that's the basic legal principle. So I wanted to, to raise that with you. I, I will link in the show notes um, Alliance Defending Freedom, if you're familiar with that group, um, joined Charitable Allies, this other a law firm at the Seventh Circuit, and they have a, a a great article or press release on this case if you want to dig into it further. And so that's, I think, a prime example of where we are in this country on the high school and on the law school campus, as we, we talked previously with Julia Barley and Professor John Hill. So as I've been reflecting on just free speech <laughs> this week, there's been a lot uh, of thought on free speech due to filing the amicus brief. I, I was just considering what does free speech cost us? What what could it cost us? What will it cost us uh, to defend this right, to, to make sure that it survives for our kids and for our grandkids? Because right now, as I'm sure you are very well aware, uh, there is a movement to say that essentially if I don't like your speech, if, I, if it offends me, then I have the right to cancel you. So it is... You know, freedom of opinion, as long as, as it is something I agree with, and if it is something that I don't agree with, I'm going to claim that it's harming me, that it's unsafe, and, and therefore has to be canceled. So I, I think we can all see where this is headed. So how, how do we champion freedom of speech? What, what will it cost us? So the first thing I would say is it will cost us our silence. It will cost us our silence. And of course, we have the right in this country to remain silent. But I would, I would say that we have the responsibility to speak up. So we have the right to remain silent, but we have the responsibility to speak up. And I think for Christians, this is, this is a difficult one because Scripture does tell us in Romans 12, 18, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. So I don't think we have to run around um, criticizing every little thing. And, and certainly our speech would be seasoned with grace. Um, and so the, the manner in which we speak is important. And we also 
don't want to just drum up unnecessary controversy. There's wisdom sometimes in just being quiet. <laughs> you know, uh, just bide your time, bite your tongue. You don't, you don't have to respond to everything uh, that people do or say to us. So there can be wisdom in that. But the in contrast, you think of Joshua 1.8. And, and this year, just in my own uh, personal walk with the Lord, this verse has come back time and time again. Um, Joshua 1.8, have not I command you, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither about be thou dismayed. For the Lord, your God is with you, is with us wherever you go. And we know that God is with us, and, and we should be strong. We should be of good courage. And I, I think of the Dietrich Bonhoeffer quote. He says, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. Not God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. And so what will free speech cost us? It'll cost us our silence. Because when something like this happens, or when something happens in your workplace, your church, your community, there's always going to be a temptation. You know what? I, I just don't want to get involved. I've got enough going on at the church. I've got enough going on at family. I've got enough going on in my job. But if we do not speak, then government will move forward with those that are involved. And the longer I'm in the public square, I know this is very basic stuff, like kind of like, well, duh. Okay. But it, it is a fact, and this is more of a, it's along the line of, of working out, of budgeting, of, of just, hey, you, you have to do it. You have to speak up. If you want your voice to be considered, well, you have to say something. I heard a pastor uh, say this week that when, when we enter the, the public square, we, we should speak up. We, we should make a difference, but we should also consider, consider the difference between a butcher and a surgeon. And I thought this was, was a great thought. This is, you know, a butcher hacks or cuts with, with no concern for life, with no concern what happens next. But a surgeon also cuts, but, but does so with the interest of the patient in mind, with the interest of improving life, improving things. And so he says, don't be a butcher, be a surgeon. I, I just thought that was beautiful. So as Christians, there can be a, a temptation to just sit back and say nothing, especially when it comes to these some of these very difficult issues. You think of the the pro life stance. We're we're in Pride Month and the biblical sexual ethic, and just just about any biblical principle. Sometimes you you bring up uh, will be controversial. But what will freedom of speech cost us? Do we want to see this continue? This this classic idea of freedom of speech, the small L classic liberalism, uh, where we have the right to voice our opinions if if we are not threatening physical violence uh, against someone else, you know what? They have a right to say it. And that's that's the cost that for us is it's going to cost us our silence because if if we are not speaking biblical principles into the public square, then everyone else's ideas are going to, to change the narrative. And I'll tell you specifically on this issue, if we do not speak up, if we do not defend the right to speak up, then we'll lose it. And I often say the best way to defend religious freedom is to use it. Uh, the same would be true of freedom of speech. So that's the first thing that free freedom of speech will cost us. It will cost us our silence. Uh, the second thing that I think freedom of speech will cost us is our silos. So our silence, our silos, and some of you are thinking, yeah, Josh, here comes your compulsive alliteration. Don't worry, the third point is not an S, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> our silos. Let me go back to that that stat uh, that came uh, from the freshman survey, a freshman survey of college students. So in the 1970s and 1980s, one out of four students wanted to ban extreme speakers, but the majority wanted to do so in 2019. And this comes on the hills of a conversation I had yesterday. I was at a, a major state event dealing with mental health, and I was speaking to uh, some student life uh, leaders at very reputable public universities. I won't name them here. Uh, but very reputable uh, public universities. And I, I left so troubled because what they described to me is that students coming in to these you know, reputable public universities will not address a, even a roommate. So let's say you're living with someone for the first time you know, outside of your home and your roommate's just doing something absolutely annoying. Now, being in, in college, I certainly experience this. I hope I wasn't the cause of some of it. My, my roommates are listening to this. They're like, yeah, I've got lots of examples, Josh. Uh, but the, what, they're, what they explained to me is that 
if there is some sort of interpersonal conflict, you know, they're one roommate's upset with the other, they will not actually talk to them about it. They will call their parents. The parents will call student life. Student life will call the other parents. And then the other parents talks to the students. And then it goes back and forth that way. Like here are these, here are these two individuals are living, you know, maybe a couple yards from each other. And they just won't have a conversation uh, about anything difficult. So something else that they mentioned, and this was the part of it that really concerned me. So they said that many of their students, what they're experiencing is their students cannot tell the difference between an uncomfortable conversation and an unsafe conversation. I'll say that again. The, the students cannot tell the difference in between an uncomfortable conversation and an unsafe conversation. So the moment that some conversation is uncomfortable, the students will just claim it's unsafe. And they will come to the stu you know, student life to say, hey, you need to cancel that person. I don't feel safe and, and because, you know, we're disagreeing. And these are, would be basic disagreements. Now, certainly, if somebody's threatening violence, that's, that's a different thing, right? But this is, this was clearly, clearly they just have diff you know, differing opinions on maybe a political view or on human sexuality or, or just anything almost. It just, but the students are having a, a, a real problem trying to differentiate between what is uncomfortable and what is unsafe. And then the motivation is, well, we have to cancel unsafe speech. Now, again, this is not news to you. I'm sure you've seen it in the news. I'm sure you have, um, you've read stories about how this is happening all across the country. So it's easy for us here to point fingers. Uh, I'm a huge fan of first looking to control what I can control. Um, and I, I would say that we are also bad about this a, as Christians. I just, if, if you're on X at all, you certainly see this too. So how are we modeling this? I say, so what will freedom of speech cost us? I say it will cost us our silos because if we want freedom of speech to endure, who or what group is going to go first? Who, who's going to go get outside of their comfort zone and go talk to people that are not like them. This is why I, I so appreciate the command in Scripture to pray for governing officials. And I'm just, I, I'm blessed just because like what I do every day, the ministry God's called me to, um, it puts me here. Now, that's that's easy for me because it's worked into my schedule. And and certainly if you are working in a Christian school or at a church, it's it's very easy to just kind of get into that Christian silo and never take time to talk with anybody that disagrees with us. You know, of course, our social media pushes us this way through algorithms. But what, what is the view for the future? Well, it is a, a view of, hey, how do we, how do we have a, a confident society where there are differing opinions? As, as Christians, we talk a lot about religious liberty for all people. Salvation cannot be coerced. So it doesn't matter if you're living in New York City or you're living in a rural town somewhere. Uh, you're going to have people that disagree with you. And it's very easy just to fall back into our silo where we're comfortable and we just talk with people that, are, you know, everybody has the same opinion all the time. I, the way I'm wired, I get tired of that uh, sometimes. And I think if you, if you actually give people the opportunity to speak, we would find there is actually much greater uh, difference of opinion uh, than perhaps is sometimes expressed. They say, you know, if, if a marriage is in perfect agreement all the time, then one of the partners is actually not sharing their opinion. Um, this is true. <laughs> this is true in ed life as well. And so we, we have to be the ones we may have to, to give up our silos. Um, what is freedom of speech going to cost us? So what about our dinner table? What about our couch watching football games? What about our church? Are, are we reaching out to folks that are different than us? And finding ways, and, and this can sound, uh, this this can sound um, like perhaps you got to get out into the public square, and you haven't been doing this already. I this could be just worked into your your normal routine. And I I think of the book by Rosaria Butterfield, the Gospel comes with a house key. Like th this should be a part of our witness anyway. So I'm not telling you anything that you don't know already. I, I'm just giving us another reason why this is so important. I mean, how, how are you going to have conversations about Christ with people that haven't come to him if, if you're not in places where they're unbelievers? And, and so it will, freedom of speech will cost us our silos. Who's going to go first to say, hey, maybe we don't agree on everything. Let's have a talk about the talk 
I don't have a lot of conversations with people about these sorts of things. I really value our relationship. I want that to continue. Um, and so if we get into a, you know, a disagreement, um, let's, let's make sure we kind of pause. And we'll come back to it. Are you okay with that? So I think freedom of speech can cost us our silos. The last thing I would say is that freedom of speech can cost us censure. Now, uh, that starts with a C for everyone that's uh, taking notes <laughs> on my compulsive alliteration. Um, it does sound like an S, so maybe I don't get any points there. But our censure, and we talked about Julia Barley, Professor Hill, how here they are just trying to pr promote the sanctity of life, uh, a, a clearly pre-political biblical uh, principle. And they're told, hey, you can't have, can't have the table. And there's, there's disagreement even from leadership at the law school. Here we have a case in, in Noblesville High School where a freshman is just trying to start a pro-life club and is, is met with conflicting opinions and then has the club derecognized uh, because of that, of that particular political opinion. I have, I've set out the facts previously. And in, in our culture today, what will free speech cost us? So if we do speak out, we do have to expect that there, there will be uh, censor. I don't know that that at times, maybe it's just disapproval. I, I'm reluctant to use the word persecution uh, very much because of believers around the world that are losing their lives, losing their freedom uh, due to sharing the gospel. But it, it can cause disapproval, and that's a weighty thing. It could maybe cost a job. Um, here it costs a, a student club. But we have to speak up anyway. Because again, if we don't speak up, then government's just going to, the, the wheels of American government are just going to roll on without our concerns. And I was looking at a case uh, that came out this week of a lifeguard in California that asked for religious accommodation not to have to fly a pride flag because he, according to his conscience, that that's going to be celebrating um, the pride flags. And these are biblical, it's contrary to biblical uh, principles, as we've discussed in the podcast a number of times. Um, and so he, he just asked, please don't make me fly them. And he was just going to fly, I believe, the American flag. And he was told, no, you, you have to. So he, he sued. An another event of you know, taking kids to a pride event. Lots of questions about what about preferred pronouns in my work email. So these types of things are not going away anytime soon. And there can be a temptation to just step back. But freedom of speech, freedom of religion says, no, you have to say something. You have to you know, be, be careful, be cautious, be circumspect, think very carefully through our, what is the right fight? When is, when is it time to say something? How am I going to say something? But we should say something. If biblical principles we should stand up. We should say something. And there's a part of this case that deeply troubles me. And I, I want to say this respectfully. I don't know this individual. Uh, and of course, this is in active litigation. But I would note that it's very clear in the record of this case that uh, Principal McCaffrey, the individual that derecognized the student club, is, uh, according to his own testimony, pro-life himself. Let that sink in for a moment. So the principal that denied recognition to the student club because there was a political um, statement on a, a picture on a flyer is personally pro-life. And... Again, I say this respectfully to, to about him. I do not know him personally, and I so I, I just want to I want to bring that fact in, but then I wanted to kind of zoom out and just talk about this a thirty thousand foot view. And then I often find that Christians are that they will do things sometimes out of fear, but then also maybe out of a a misplaced sense of appropriateness. So. Even if you know my personal views are pro-life in a position as a government official, you know I have to respect all groups. But if if that's I mean that's the position, right? You if if you're in a government role in a plural society, we we talked about religious liberty for all people. I have to respect all groups. But then it's like well, except for this view, <laughs> except perhaps the view that I hold, or except for the pro-life view. Like we can have all these other views, but we just can't have this one. And, and so I'm not sure where that's coming from. I think some of it may, may be fear of censure, but this, this kind of, I think it's a misplaced sense of, I don't know if it's compassion or I just don't want to, I don't want to stir anything up. I don't want to cause controversy. I, I think we have to just get over that. And so here's, here's a rule. We should defer on preferences. Again, we live peaceably with all men. You know, if I, I'm willing to be uncomfortable 
so that someone else will come to Christ. But here's the thing. We should defend our principles. We should defer on preferences, but defend our principles. John Stone Street has this great quote. Does God's morality get in the way of God's gospel? The answer is no. The law shows us that we fall short of God's standard and that we need salvation through Jesus Christ. And so I see a quickly changing culture. And again, um, I defer to Chris McCaffrey. I can't, of course, can't speak for his motivations. All I just know from the record is he's personally pro-life and that the student group was derecognized. But for all of us, I just sense this kind of across the movement of with quickly changing culture. Well, we just, you know, we, we just have to give up. We just have to kind of lay down what we believe. So again, I think that's a, a misplaced, you know, a misplaced line. So defer on preference as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men, but absolutely be strong and courageous, stand up for your principles. So we should defer on preference, but defend our principles. So to close out the episode, here today, uh, I just I come back to that reflection on, you know, what lesson is Noblesville High School teaching? What lesson are law schools teaching? Are they teaching a robust view of civil dialogue? You know, here's how you do life with people that disagree with you. Here's the difference between an uncomfortable conversation and an unsafe conversation. We live in a participatory democracy this is not the last time you're going to have to deal with this. In fact, it may be even more difficult. So schools are the nurseries of democracy. This is something that we have to stand up on. And then what, how are we, how, how are we exemplifying this? How are we modeling this? And I, I talked a little bit about this in the last episode. It's like, where, where are the leaders? Where are the leaders? I, I of course, respect uh, the younger generation. I want to learn from them. But if you've been tasked with leadership and your job is to teach or to train or to model what is civil dialogue, then, then do it. Lead. <laughs> and I may take off my, pa my attorney hat in, in a sense, you know, talking about legal issues uh, and, and more kind of a, a pastor hat for just a moment. I, I am amazed at how many people will go through life suffering because they will not have one hard, one difficult conversation. And so be strong, be strong and courageous. You, you can say things that are difficult as a surgeon and say, you know, this is a hard thing, but it needs to be said. Need, somebody needs to stand up and say it. Sometimes I see that in church life where there's dysfunction or family life. Somebody needs to stand up and say it. Well, be the one to do so. And, and so what lesson is, is noble teaching? Let's lead, let's defer on preferences, but defend on principles. So what will free speech cost us? The first thing it will cost us is our, our silence. We need to speak up when the time is appropriate. We pray for wisdom to do that, but then we pray for the courage to do it. The next thing is it will cost us our silos. Are we the ones that are, are going first? It's easy to sit back here on a podcast and just say, hey, you know, we need to get out there and make a difference. I am, I am doing my best um, to 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 go talk to people, to be in situations where there, there is disagreement and try to work through that. Uh, would love to hear your stories about how you're doing this well in, in your sphere of influence. Josh at goodcitizen.us would, would love to hear those stories. Lastly, it may cost us our censure. It, it may cost us disapproval, even the loss of a job. But do we want free speech for our kids, our grandkids, you know, so that when they go to college, uh, so that when they step into their neighborhood and they just share a biblical principle, they aren't canceled. Well, it's it's our watch, folks. It's our time. Uh, we got to stand up for this thing if we want it to endure. So those are the, the things that free speech costs. Uh, in a sense, our silence, our silos, and our censure. We'd love to hear your feedback. And we'll have some links in the show notes to, again, the case that I talked about today. So that is what free speech costs. We'll see you next week.